This week on Christian World News, as Christianity fades across Europe, one tiny nation is experiencing a resurgence of faith. Many say it's all due to one man. Plus, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We'll show you how that's true throughout history, right up till today. And a Bible for every person in every language will show you how the technology that's making it possible. Welcome to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. Thanks for being with us today. Christianity is dying across Europe. Churches closing as growing numbers of Europeans abandon the faith. But we found a tiny nation where the opposite is happening. As George Thomas shows us, it's thanks to the efforts of one man that Christianity is not only alive, but thriving in the country of Georgia. On any given Sunday morning, you'll find most churches in Georgia packed with the faithful. And one of the first things a visitor will notice is that there are no pews or chairs in most Georgian churches. That's because, unlike typical church meetings, Christians here stand during their services. We say that uh, Orthodox Christians are like candles because they stand before God in churches. It's uncomfortable to stand for two hours, three hours in a row, but we, we choose to. That was the case during a service at Holy Trinity Cathedral in Georgia's capital of Tbilisi. As thousands stood listening to their nation's most famous citizen. His name, Ilya II, and he leads one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. The history of the Georgian church dates back to the first century AD when the apostles of Jesus Christ entered Georgia and preached the gospel. At 83, this elder statesman has been affectionately dubbed the most trusted man in Georgia. He's the spiritual father of Georgia and a wonderful example of what it means to be a humble servant of God. You've probably never heard of him, but here in Georgia and surrounding countries, Ilya II is more famous than movie stars and politicians. Patriarch Ilya II is the most respected figure in Georgian society. In fact, his favorable poll numbers are over 90%. In an exclusive interview conducted at his private residence, Ilya II, whose official title is Patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church, spoke with CBN News about his country's deep love for God. The church's past is intertwined with the people and history of our nation. In the 4th century AD, Christianity was officially declared as a state religion. That makes Georgia one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. Tucked between the Caucasus Mountains and the Black Sea, more than 85% here say they belong to the Orthodox Church. And while many neighboring European countries have seen religious adherence fall, Christianity in Georgia is witnessing unprecedented growth. We are like a little spiritual oasis in the middle of this region. Patrick Ilya II was installed back on Christmas Day 1977, and since then he has managed to single-handedly revive the Georgian Orthodox Church. He took over at a time when Christianity was under severe persecution from the Soviet government. The Bolshevik invasion in 1921 witnessed the unmerciful destruction of churches and monasteries across Georgia. Sergo Vardorzanitse is a professor of Georgian history. There were 1,500 churches and 1,600 clergymen active in Georgia. When the Patriarch was installed, there were only 50 churches and barely 70 priests remaining. He initiated a range of reforms to rebuild the church, including an emphasis on young people. He reached out to the youth, encouraging them to attend church and to consider the priesthood. He also took steps to make church services more engaging and easier to listen to. The church showed signs of revival in the late 1980s. Men like Ione Gamarekeli, impressed by the patriarch's humility and dedication to service, decided to join the priesthood. The patriarch stretched out his hands to the people and the people responded. He preached God's word and people turned to God. 
Then came the Soviet Union collapse in the late 90s, which led to Christianity's renewal. The changes have since been profound. Now there are more than 2,000 active churches, with new ones being built every year, like this massive structure rising on the outskirts of Tbilisi. Also, more than 3,000 people have joined the priesthood, serving the spiritual needs of Georgia's nearly 4 million people. It has been said that the patriarch inherited a church that was severely persecuted and covered in shroud. Now it is a living body. Nearly three hours after arriving for the service, a slow and frail Patriarch Ilya II finally makes his way through the throngs of worshippers that have gathered to hear him speak this Sunday morning. CBN News is granted unprecedented access to film as hundreds of men, women and children line the ornate halls of Holy Trinity Cathedral to receive a prayer or special blessing. The Patriarch always says that all that's been achieved during his reign is because of the Lord's will. After decades of religious repression, many are grateful that the church in Georgia has not only survived, but is thriving, thanks in part to one man's desire to bring his nation closer to God. Many kind achievements have been accomplished, and I thank God for letting me undertake such endeavors for our nation. George Thomas, CBN News, in Tbilisi, Georgia. Thanks, George. And you can help spread the good news about how God is at work around the world. Simply log on to our CWN webpage and share this story with your family and friends on Facebook. Coming up, Tried by Fire, the story of Christianity's first 1,000 years and why it still matters today. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. Last week, we talked about a Russian law that would outlaw evangelism. President Putin officially signed that law this week. It forbids evangelism outside of churches and other religious sites. That means people can't even share their faith in their homes or on the Internet. Russian evangelicals are fasting and praying. They invite the global church to join them. Pakistani police are on a nationwide manhunt for a Christian man accused of blasphemy. Nadim Masi is alleged to have sent a derogatory poem about the Prophet Muhammad to a Muslim friend and is now on the run for his life. The Independent reports police have arrested Nadim's two sisters in hopes that he would give himself up. Under Pakistan's blasphemy laws, anyone accused of insulting Islam can be sentenced to death. The law is often used to persecute the Pakistani Christian minority. 
The third century writer Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well, a new book reveals that's as true today as it was in the early years of Christianity. Ephraim Graham has more. From Africa to the Middle East to Asia and around the globe, Christians today are the target of persecution. Open Doors USA says nearly 4,000 Christians are killed for their faith every year. Thousands more suffer violence in the form of beatings, abductions, rapes, and false arrests. Author and historian Bill Bennett says persecution of the church today may be the worst in history. I think it may be worse today. I think in terms of sheer numbers, if you count the Middle East, Islam, if you count China, if you count other places, the persecution of Christians uh, goes, uh, goes, on, goes on every day. Some small Christian sects in the Middle East, in Iraq, in, uh, in, in Iran, have been eliminated maybe forever. But from the earliest days of the church, whenever persecution increases, the church grows and even flourishes. Bennett calls that one of the awe-inspiring paradoxes of Christianity. Whatever they could imagine to do to Christians, they did. But the remarkable thing is, and, and uh, you quoted it, uh, the, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. The more the persecution took place, the faster uh, the church grew. Bennett writes about the early years of church persecution, perseverance, and expansion in a detailed historical narrative called Tried by Fire, the story of Christianity's first thousand years. It is a remarkable story. I mean, this little sect uh, becomes uh, one of the religions of the world and changes the world forever, Christianity. And uh, the story is, is, is not well known. I like to think of it as the second greatest story ever told. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. New signs that China's next generation is turning toward Christianity. Many millennials are looking for answers to life's big questions in the church. Meng Fai Li brings us the story. China is getting younger and younger. Today, large cities like Shanghai are filled with millennials. 24 million people live in Shanghai and three-fourths are between the ages of 20 and 33. Younger Chinese are moving to Shanghai for several reasons. I moved to Shanghai a few years ago. My friends kept telling me I could find better jobs here. I want to earn more money for my family. Besides looking for jobs, millennials have also joined the Christian community. To cope with societal pressure, young people are increasingly turning to support groups and spirituality. One study found that 62% of China's religious believers are between the ages of 19 and 39. One day, my friend invited me to church after work. It was new to me. As I listened to the music, all of a sudden, I felt so peaceful. I felt something special. Christian leaders in Shanghai realize young people are attending churches because they long for places where they can take a break and express themselves openly. Living in the big city is not easy for them. Many of the young people share with me that they face burden all the time. Some of them just cried to me and asked me to help them. Church leaders use biblical truths to help millennials cope with life. They share their own experiences and tell them about God's grace. For the single people, I understand their concerns. I read the story of Ruth and explained the meaning to them. I wanted to make sure they understood that I had the same struggle before. But God is faithful. With the leader's help, some young Chinese attend church services faithfully. They learn to pray for themselves and their family and they no longer feel empty inside. Now I am a Christian. I'm not afraid of anything. Jesus is always with me. I'm not alone when I face difficulties. Today, with the huge millennial population, Shanghai still remains as one of the important cities in China. Local Christian leaders are looking for opportunities to bring the younger generation to church. Mainly, they believe younger generation might be the only solution to bring this city closer to God. We want to use all the resources to build the bridge between young people and our Savior. They could do some amazing work for Jesus. Meng Fei Li for CBN News, Shanghai, China. 
Thank you so much. Well, up next, the technology that's making it possible to bring the gospel to every tribe and tongue. That story, when we come back. God has a plan. God has a future and a destiny for every one of us. We need times of testing. You can't get strong without it. I truly believe angels were there with me. Are you willing to risk your pride and take a step of faith? See true stories of people who overcame impossible odds in victory through life storms. Available now. God has a plan to do you good, not harm. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Welcome back. Jesus promised that he would return to the earth when the gospel reaches the whole world. And for the first time in history, that can happen thanks to technology. We could soon see the Bible available to every person in every language. Paul Strand has the story. These three men all have a passion for the Bible, and each plays a key role in making it possible for everyone on earth to have access to the scripture in our lifetimes. Bob Creason, head of Wycliffe Bible Translators, says putting God's Word into the Earth's 6,900 languages is well on the way. This tree at their Orlando Visitor Center shows what 6,900 looks like. About a third of those don't need any work, a third of, third of those are underway, and about a third, around 1,800, don't have one word of Scripture yet. High-tech innovations are slashing the average 40-year time it used to take for a first translation. It has accelerated the pace such that now it takes about 10 years or even less for a New Testament to be done. Mart Green began his drive to spread the word when he watched a Guatemalan tribesman cry after waiting 40 years to get his hands on the scriptures. And I even wondered if it was a good return on investment, you know, spent all that time and money for just 30,000 Eastern Hawkel texts. But when Gaspar went forward to get his Bible, he did something I'd never seen before, and he openly wept to get God's Word. My passion every day since then has been to make sure that everybody has God's Word. And the language they speak, they're what we call the heart language. Creason recalls a similar moment for some African church women when a Bible translator read them the Easter story. So he read them the story and they just started weeping. Weeping, he said, mothers, why are you crying? And they said, we've never heard this story before. He says, yes, you have. You've heard this story many times before. But then all of a sudden he realized they'd only heard it in French. They'd never heard it in their mother tongue, which was Yambetta. Bible apps like YouVersion allow people to access the Bible in a few seconds on their digital devices, even in countries where it's banned. So instead of carrying a Bible around that might put your life at risk, now you carry your phone around. Bobby Grunewald came up with YouVersion, which has been downloaded more than 150 million times. The app's been used in every single country and territory on the planet, including places where the Bible's prohibited, where people were caught with the Bible, they'd be put to death. Grunewald remembers a Malaysian woman first realizing she and her people could finally read banned scriptures. When she was young, they'd burned all the Bibles in that language. The last time she had seen God's Word in her language, she was a little girl. And one of the things that she said is she said, they can't burn this. And when she's talking about the app. An added benefit, visual and audio Bibles help with illiteracy. People will actually uh, either read on their phones or read in a book. They'll listen to the recorded version and they'll actually learn how to read 
using the scriptures and listening to the audio. In addition to reaching the world, reaching the young is also important, and technology makes a huge difference in that goal. Us and our partners, we've invested millions of dollars in building an app that we really feel like is at the top level in terms of its engagement with kids and something that we really are excited about because it's engaging my children in the Bible every day. The Bible app for kids is certainly changing the way that children relate to the Bible, but in some cases, it's even affecting adults. Like an atheist who said he'd do whatever it took to help his daughter learn. His daughter was interested in God, and so the Bible app for kids became a resource for him to actually teach her. So we had an atheist parent that's actually teaching their children about the Bible using the Bible app for kids. It's quite incredible. Meanwhile, Green and his allies have made spreading the word easier by creating the Digital Bible Library and convincing those who own rights to various Bible translations to share. So when somebody comes up with an incredible idea like Uversion and needs all these texts, they don't have to fly all around the world to get it. That allowed Uversion to reach a recent milestone of offering 1,000 free translations to the world. And that access is getting faster all the time. Sometimes it takes six months to a year to get the printed version out, but in the Digital Bible Library, Uversion can go in there, pull out that text, and in about 20 minutes put these things out now. Mark Green's goal is clear. My passion is by the year 2033 that 95% of the world will have a whole Bible, 999 will have a New Testament, and 100% will have at least 25 chapters. Imagine this, in our lifetimes, all the people throughout the whole world finally having their very own version of the Bible, no matter what language they speak. Could this hasten the day when the gospel is finally preached to the very ends of the earth? Jesus in Matthew 24, 14 spoke of such a day. He says, after all have heard, then I'll come back. The end will come. We're hastening the return of Jesus Christ. No, no predictions. <laughs> I'm not in the business of being a prophet, but I really do believe that's true. Two things are going to last forever, the souls of man and God's word. So if we can put God's word into people, then we feel like we're doing something that lasts forever. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Orlando. Thanks, Paul. Well, thanks to Superbook, kids in Hong Kong are becoming better students. This past spring and summer, the University of Hong Kong's education department helped young students who were struggling in school. The teaching began in small groups of 13 students using Superbook family discussion guides from the Superbook DVDs. Since then, students have seen improvement in their lessons and their self-confidence. The university plans on continuing the program and helping many more children with the Superbook ministry. To learn more about Superbook, you can check out our website, cbnnews.com, and stay with us, because we'll be right back. CBN presents Victory Through Life Storms, the newest teaching from Pat Robertson. You're about to meet people who've gone through some of the toughest struggles life had to offer. The pain is something I just can't explain with 700 Club co-host Terry Mewson. We all go through seasons of struggle in our lives. I never wanted to be divorced. They loaded me up on painkillers. She said, you are eaten up with cancer. In Victory Through Life Storms, Pat Robertson will equip you with the tools you need to come through your personal storm victoriously. In the midst of trouble, God isn't limited. It's such abundance. See the stories of people who obtained their victory over seemingly insurmountable odds. Take a step of faith. What he did for me, he will do for others. Victory Through Life Storms. Jesus said, look, all things are possible. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. Available now. To hit middle school and start having same-sex attractions was just very confusing because I had, had accepted the Lord when I was a little girl. Right in the middle of this holiness code is a reference to homosexual practice. I don't think Christians have anything to fear from research, from science done well. They're like, oh, this is awful. You don't let him in the house, do you? Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. A new discovery in Israel may help solve the mystery of the biblical Philistines. A team of archaeolo I can't say a team of archaeologists, there we go, unearthed the bones of more than 200 ancient Philistines in the biblical city of Ashkelon. 
Experts say this is the first Philistine cemetery ever recovered. The discovery marks the end of a 30-year excavation and the beginning of new research. The team is now performing DNA tests on the bone samples to resolve the ongoing debate over the Philistines' geographical origins. Wow, got through that. Well, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had a message for evangelical Christians in Nairobi, Kenya, during his recent trip to Africa. As Chris Mitchell reports, Netanyahu says Israel has no better friends than Christians who support and love the Jewish nation. And he told them, you are welcome in Israel. The sound of shofars greeted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He invited the crowd to come to Israel the land of the Bible. Those of you who were, come again. Those of you who didn't come, come first time. You'll visit Jerusalem, visit Nazareth. You'll come to the Sea of Galilee. He told them a story about a kibbutz that discovered a 2,000-year-old boat. It's a fishing boat, and they carbon dated it. And it's right at the time of Jesus. So it stands there in Kibbutz Ginosal, and when you come there, you'll say, now, look, I can't tell you that Jesus was on that boat, <laughs> but I can tell you that that boat was in the time of Jesus. He described the common bond of Jews and Christians grounded in the land of the Bible. These are real places. They speak to you and they speak to us. We came back to the land of Israel and realized the dreams of the prophets, of the ingathering of the exiles. I'm glad, I'm glad I have the opportunity, the privilege, really of coming uh, to Africa to meet you. We have no better friends in the world, none. We, uh, we appreciate our, this friendship. And we're expanding it into the continent of Africa. Netanyahu's trip represents a new beginning in African-Israeli relations. Seven leaders from seven African countries talking about how to expand Israel's relationship with their countries, but with all the countries of Africa. Israel is coming back to Africa. Africa is coming back to Israel. We want to see Africa be the success story that it can be, and we want to be part of it in everything, in water, in agriculture, in dairy production. And we are eager to share all of this with our African friends. He also described the dismal situation for Christians in the Middle East. And in the Middle East today, unfortunately, the attitude towards Christians and Christianity is not a good one. You see what is happening with Daesh in Iraq, what is happening to Christian communities and to the Yazidis and to others. There is one place in the Middle East where the Christian community is not only not shrinking, it's thriving and expanding and it's safe and it's welcome, and that place is Israel. You are welcome in Israel. At the end of the meeting, the Christian leaders presented Netanyahu with a gift. It's the Lion of Judah. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. I've been to Israel three times, and I can't wait to go back. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week. Be sure to like us on Facebook. My Twitter handle is WendyGCBN. I look forward to you following me there. Well, until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye, and as always, God bless you.